first. Okay, so recording's going, we're good. Um, so hi everybody, uh, thanks so much for attending today. Um, I really wanna give a warm welcome to Dr. Arif Hamid today for our Beacon Seminar. Um, Arif is currently an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota, um, where he recently started his lab and he's recruiting. So keep, keep up on his lab website. Um, his research has focused mainly on understanding the roles that dopamine, the dopamine system plays in reinforcement learning. Um, he trained as a neuroscience PhD student at the University of Michigan with um, Dr. Josh Burke and was a postdoc fellow at Brown University with Michael Frank and Chris Moore. Um, Arif has received numerous awards, including uh, the prestigious Hannah Gray Fellowship. This is an eight-year career development award that's funded by um, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. He also has received the NIH Office of the Director's Rising Star Award, um, as well as the Allen Institute's Next Generation Leader Award, amongst many others. Um, and so before I let Arif kick off with his talk, um, please just let me remind everyone to keep your mics muted um, and hold your questions to the end of the talk. And at that point, you can either type them into the chat or raise your hand and I can call on you to ask it yourself. Um, so thanks so much, Arif, for being here. Um, with that, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Awesome. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Lauren. And thanks for uh, everybody um, for attending. Um, if, if there are any you know, burning questions uh, somewhere, uh, just uh, feel free to, to chime in. I'm also happy uh, to uh, take questions at any point. So um, I'm really excited to be uh, part of uh, this ongoing seminar series. Um, and like uh, Lauren just said, I also just opened up my lab at University of Minnesota, where it's uh, a day and a half old. And uh, uh, we study uh, the neurotransmitter uh, dopamine, but mostly what we really care about is really un trying to understand how the nervous system, the brain, uh, tries to orchestrate adaptive and flexible behaviors, and most specifically tries to meet this challenging demand of uh, satisfying both the present and, and the future. And what I mean by this is to really be able to use past experiences and uh, choose uh, decisively among actions in the moment uh, while still being able to store the consequences of these actions uh, so that they can be uh, used in the future. And of course, as many of you know, the, the corticobase ganglia circuitry uh, together with the dopaminergic neurotransmission are really critical uh, to help resolve some of these challenges. And we know that the overall uh, function of the circuit is really to decide what is uh, worth doing, to select among potential candidate actions and further energize them. And really with uh, this dopaminergic uh, neurotransmission, uh, we really also get an opportunity uh, to uh, flexibly adapt based on what has worked before. So uh, this is really a uh, brain locus for reinforcement learning. So the overarching research goals of uh, my lab are really to understand what constant decision signals are being relayed by the neurotransmitter dopamine as it modulates this uh, overarching cortical uh, basic ganglia thalamic circuitry and uh, really be able to go under the hood and understand at the implementation level what the biological substrates are that help support very specific computational operations uh, that this dopaminergic neuromodulation of this underlying circuit um, helps perform. And I'll give you an example of this uh, in this talk today. But really the, the, the overarching goal is really to be able to uh, understand how different behavioral demands end up leveraging these underlying circuit and computational specializations to really afford adaptive and behavior, uh, be, uh, adaptive uh, behaviors. So I'm sure I don't have to motivate this crowd too much that dopamine is indeed a really important neurotransmitter, has key roles in kind of a variety of uh, normal uh, behaviors, but also gets implicated in a, in a variety of uh, psychiatric and neurological disorders. Um, um, dopamine cells in the, at least in the rodent here, side view of the rodent, tend to live here in the midbrain. There's a very small amount of them, um, relatively speaking, uh, but they make these really impressive, dense uh, forward uh, projections uh, towards the forebrain and most notably arborize in the striatum quite densely. So uh, while the exact kind of understanding of uh, accounting of what uh, this neurotransmitter dopamine is doing uh, within the circuitry continues to be refined and studies, studied. Uh, what I want to do uh, by way of motivation is really to provide uh, some uh, uh, foundational uh, knowledge, a summary of uh, foundational knowledge at, at multiple levels of analysis to really help motivate uh, the remaining portions of my uh, talk. <clears throat> 
So we know these uh, corticobasic ganglia uh, circuits, like I mentioned, are thought to take in uh, candidate proposals from the cortex and really through these uh, divergent uh, direct and indirect pathways, uh, decide whether or not to accept or reject these uh, proposals. And so we know that dopaminergic neurotransmission on a short time scale, at least at the cellular level, we know tends to uh, increase the excitability of these uh, D1 receptor expressing direct pathway cells while simultaneously suppressing the excitability or responsibility of these uh, D2 receptor expressing indirect pathway cells. But, but on a longer time scales, uh, we also know that dopaminergic modulation at the corticostriatal uh, synapse, transient increases in dopamine, are, are thought to affect the plasticity um, of the synapse by causing spices on the spines on these uh, postsynaptic cells to grow here uh, in real time. And so one consequence of this is if you think of this corticobasic ganglia a pathway as performing an OR operation on these uh, cortical proposals, these short time scale effects are really transiently affecting the porosity of this corticobasic ganglia gate by biasing uh, the computation towards the direct pathway and causing the circuit to be more likely to accept than to reject ongoing proposals from the cortex. By contrast, these uh, long-term uh, synaptic effects are then uh, going to bias really the synaptic set point or associativity of the circuitry. And so uh, while uh, making this leap towards the behavioral level of analysis has been a, really a challenge in systems and behavioral neuroscience, what we've started to learn uh, from longstanding studies are really that uh, momentary increases in dopamine are associated with momentary elevations in the adaptive vigor uh, um, animals expressed really to help to energize actions towards uh, goals. And this has been demonstrated by, you know, these subsequent ramps and dopamines as animals tend to approach these uh, desired uh, goals, um, goal locations. Um, and these uh, set of, uh, uh, by the way, I'm just glossing over them, but there's really an extensive literature that supports uh, these uh, behavior level analyses, but these have been really integrated into uh, theoretical frameworks that suggest that dopamine is really important for the motivational desire to pursue goals, right? These are ongoing functions of dopamine. And here's one uh, from Ken Berridge, uh, an incentive savings hypothesis. I should also emphasize that there's a parallel literature that suggests that Dynamic changes in the firing of dopamine is really important for moments in which animals have to learn from the environment so that you can drive a reinforcement uh, that really helps affect future behaviors. And I'll just gloss over this uh, because I'm sure many of you guys are well aware. These are seminal studies by Wolfram Schultz many years ago demonstrated that dopaminergic activity, for example, in this particular study uh, changes their activation from an initial cue that's uh, reliably paired with a reward. Um, instead of responding to the reward itself, it starts to respond to the initial cue itself. And so these and many other studies over the, the decades um, have really been integrated into a, a reinforcement learning a neurocomputational framework for dopamine, when dopamine is thought to encode this reward prediction error term that is really used to iteratively adjust uh, value functions that, to help animals um, learn uh, to adjust their behaviors for future reward pursuit. I'm sorry, that was a whirlwind of a summary, but really what I'm trying to illustrate here is that what I've summarized across these two columns are really the contributions of dopamine to both ongoing, you know, present demands as to how, whether or not, uh, by helping to invigorate ongoing performance and also uh, demands uh, by the future so that we are uh, flexibly incorporating the environmental or reward feedback to pursue future rewards. Now, um, I should just say that reconciling the learning versus performance aspect of dopamine has really been a longstanding uh, challenge in, in, uh, the, uh, in the field. And this is uh, one area, for example, I uh, tackled when I was in graduate school. And I'll just very uh, briefly summarize this. So together, um, by doing measurements in the nucleus accumbens uh, ventral uh, striatal subregion in a rodent reinforcement learning task, together with uh, manipulating uh, dopaminergic activity using optogenetic methods, and also an ongoing reinforcement, uh, reinforcement learning model that captures the ongoing decision process that the animal is engaged in, we really make, uh, made the case uh, the dopamine um, the dopamine encodes uh, this uh, multiplex motivational uh, learning signals within this nucleus accumbens core. And we really uh, suggested that this is uh, accomplished by dopamine uh, conveying a reward expectation or value signal 
And uh, what we, remember, what we uh, meant by this, and I'll just summarize this very briefly on this slide because it will uh, uh, be useful uh, uh, for me later on in this talk, is that really reward expectations are future discounted ex uh, are, are rewards uh, expected. And that uh, if rewards are uh, smaller in magnitude or less probable, um, and so forth, these reward expectations uh, will also scale accordingly. And what uh, we reasoned was that these discounted reward expectation signals um, in the present are actually really useful motivational uh, decision signals to pursue these distant uh, future rewards. And so uh, these uh, ongoing levels of these uh, expectation uh, signals can be a useful motivational variable. Moreover, Unexpected reward cues can dynamically adjust uh, these expectation signals. For example, an initial pessimistic expectation would be corrected to a very large extent, whereas an initial optimistic expectation will be corrected online uh, to a very small extent. Because by definition, uh, temporal difference reward prediction errors are rapid deviations from uh, value, uh, we thought that these uh, deflections in dopamine uh, would themselves also be correlated or be related to reward prediction errors. And so uh, we suggested that a dynamically varying, uh, varying value signal uh, will simultaneously encode motivational, multiplex motivational and uh, learning signals uh, together. And so indeed we demonstrated this uh, empirically. Uh, we showed that the moment by moment uh, changes in dopamine uh, were highly correlated with our model estimates of value signals. And that there are these rapid deflections in dopamine, particularly at the reward outcome time points, that were highly correlated to reward prediction error signals um, across a variety of uh, reward rates. We also causally demonstrated that these uh, signals, these dopaminergic levels, uh, can be used to regulate the immediate motivational figure of the animal bidirectionally, and that they can also affect the future behavior of these animals, that uh, uh, animals are more likely to repeat choices that were associated, for example, with extra stimulation of, of dopamine, being able to uh, affect future behaviors. But to just uh, briefly summarize, um, our studies really revealed that within this nucleus accumbens motivational hotspot, uh, the dopamine encodes the value of motivation, uh, motivational engagement or, or work to pursue these uh, distant rewards. And in a follow-up, um, and this suggested that this is a really neat coding or multiplexing strategy that the dopamine system uses to affect both ongoing and also future behaviors. In a follow-up study together with a postdoc in the lab, uh, we also demonstrated in the, if, if in the same task you uh, record the spiking activity of midbrain dopamine cells, you actually end up with uh, uh, encoding of reward prediction error term. While this uh, result is quite perplexing and continues uh, to be uh, uh, an, an interesting but also a weird finding, at the time we thought this could actually be a, a potential adaptive circuit strategy, this midbrain forebrain dissociation of uh, decision signals being encoded by the dopaminergic circuitry. And we thought perhaps this might allow these target striatal subregions to tailor dopamine according to their own uh, uh, computational and uh, behavioral demands. Now it remains largely unknown if uh, brain-wide dopamine is indeed systematically dissociated, correlated um, according to very specific computational and circuit mechanisms. And so now uh, I'm sure many of you will appreciate that there are indeed many clues for requiring dopamine to be target tailored. We know that these corticobasic ganglia circuits are organized into these repeating motifs that span the limbic, cognitive, and, and sensory motor domains. And uh, there's also a lot of evidence that they're anatomically distinguishable, either based on cortical and thalamic projection patterns, or also the, the local uh, molecular architecture or, or uh, phenotype of different uh, straddle subregions, uh, the genetic and protein levels. We also know that um, anatomically and functionally, these uh, pathways are not only organized in these parallel spirals of these continued uh, closed loops, but they are also uh, organized in these hierarchical spirals that are themselves um, organized in, in these varying levels of abstraction or, or time scales of planning. Um, some of these uh, being, for example, initially suggested by the famous work of Susan uh, Haber's anatomical work. 
And so we thought, you know, if uh, dopamine nonetheless across these uh, functionally and anatomically segregated subregions still needs to be able to perform its dual functions across these repeating modules, that it needs to allow, you know, uh, these individual subloops to energize or express the learned values that are stored within these subloops, while also simultaneously allowing these uh, subloops to learn a new value or, or learn from a different reward output. Now, a detailed description of such a heterogeneous function is really a significant gap in our understanding of, of dopaminergic neurotransmission brain-wide. And I'll just uh, make that point in the slide here, uh, wherein the goal of my postdoctoral work, which I'll describe to you today, is really to uh, reevaluate our current understanding of functional specialization of dopamine. And we, as many of you know, we have this really uh, important framework for dopamine, which is itself incomplete, which basically based on observations of, you know, synchronized activation patterns of midbrain dopaminergic cells that uh, redundantly encode for reward prediction errors. And also this really impressive divergent anatomy of the dopaminergic axons really uh, suggested that dopamine is this kind of ascending uh, uh, broadcast system, which kind of an interpretation that is also uh, levied against uh, other uh, ascending neuromodulator systems, for example. And we thought uh, that this is actually not computationally advantageous. For example, if you have different uh, corticobase ganglia sub uh, regions or channels, if you will, that are themselves engaged uh, to different proportions indicated by the size of these circles and gating through some of these uh, proposals, blasting everybody with the uh, unitary dopaminergic signals is really not, um, uh, is itself quite uh, computationally impoverished. What has been suggested in the literature is really to vector weight these dopaminergic signals, in inject heterogeneity at the level of the spiking here. So while there's some uh, evidence for this and uh, potentially some plausible anatomy for this, um, this is yet to be demonstrated. Um, and actually some of the empirical uh, work that I'll uh, show you today uh, might suggest another node of specialization here directly at the release level and not necessarily at the spiking level. And so one revised view of this uh, might suggest that there are indeed specialized dopaminergic signals at the target regions themselves that are tailored to the underlying subregions computational uh, requirement specialization. And so um, the challenges of advising, uh, advancing such a revised view is really that there, uh, we need to uh, describe fundamental organizational rules of how activity uh, across these target subregions ends up uh, propagating both in space and in time. And that there um, must be some circuit general computational descriptions of dopamine across these heterogeneous uh, uh, stridal subregions. And so uh, today I'll describe, I'll try to convince you that there are indeed these uh, wave like uh, dopaminergic propagation patterns um, uh, that may uh, end up being such a fundamental organizational rule of how uh, dopamine uh, uh, arrives at target subregions. And I'll try to make the case that there are indeed a spatial and temporal vectorizations of these dynamic reward prediction error and value signals uh, that are restricted to different epochs of, of animal performance. So perhaps I could just uh, pause here and take any uh, uh, potential uh, uh, questions for clarification and or others. Doesn't seem like there are any, so I'll just continue. Yeah, please do feel free to interrupt. I'm really happy to take questions. <clears throat> so the way I set out to do this is by doing large scale imaging of the organization of dopaminergic axons uh, by injecting large uh, boluses of uh, uh, virus that contain uh, uh, GCAMP6 um, in a pre-dependent manner in <clears throat> dopaminergic uh, in, in mice that have their dopamine neurons uh, uh, expressing Cree recombinase in order to be able to uh, infect a very large amount of dopaminergic axons. But I also combine this with a parallel method uh, wherein we directly express uh, the fluorescent dopamine sensor d light directly into uh, striatal uh, uh, cells. And then I have this optical preparation wherein I aspirate off the overlying uh, cortex in order to get optical access to this dorsal surface of the dorsal striatum. And this uh, cannula is itself three millimeter in diameter. And in a mouse brain, it gives me access to 60 to 80% of this dorsal surface of the dorsal striatum. 
this is kind of what it looks like right after uh, surgery. Uh, but once the blood clears away, you can see that I get really extensive access to the dorsal striatum. This is the lateral ventricle. I get really nice access to more medial parts, more lateral parts, and also posterior parts of the dorsal striatum. And I put these animals on one uh, on head uh, restrained uh, uh, setups uh, and assess activity of dopamine axons within the dorsal striatum, uh, both at the one and two photon level. Oh yeah, a, a large, what I'm going to summarize, uh, this uh, paper uh, was just uh, published. Please uh, feel free to take a look. And so one of the uh, most surprising and initial findings uh, that we observed were that the spontaneous activation of dopaminergic axons uh, in mice that are in a dark chamber with no external cues is that there are these uh, spatially and temporally continuous activation patterns that I'm gonna refer to as uh, wave-like or dopamine waves. Um, you can see that uh, these responses uh, uh, span really large, large, large territories of, of the dorsal striatum. This is not only true in the G-CAMP calcium activity of the dopamine axons, but is also apparent in the direct concentration of dopamine as it propagates, um, as it starts off in some regions and propagates across the different, different parts of the striatum. Uh, some uh, people were, I think, interested in this. So we also demonstrated that if you label uh, the, uh, the uh, axons uh, with a red shifted calcium indicator and then put a green shifted uh, dopamine concentration, you also find uh, quite a, a strong relationship between uh, the axonal activation and the release across these uh, different parts of the striatum. And I can say more on, on that if uh, there are specific questions. I also put the slide in here because I get this question quite frequently. Um, is, is, is it really that I aspirate off the overlying cortex that uh, end up these, uh, with these dopamine waves that themselves could be pathological because of removal of cortex? And, and to, achieve, to answer that, we put in you know, grid-like organized optic, uh, thin optic fibers that were inserted uh, deep into the striatum. And we we're indeed able to uh, uh, assay activations uh, that were in themselves uh, recruited in these continuous uh, and uh, spatial uh, propagation that resembled quantitatively uh, uh, resembled these wave-like activations uh, uh, with uh, um, like like the uh, the candela version. Okay, so just very briefly, uh, with one uh, thing that these uh, waves end up doing is that they are um, a really nice way to coordinate uh, activity uh, of dopamine across functionally uh, related stratal subregions. So. Here are activation patterns of dopamine uh, in different stratal uh, subregions. But if you look at their systematic correlation organized in space, uh, what we find is that more distant stratal subregions are actually quite heterogeneous in their uh, dopaminergic uh, recruitment, but nearby stratal subregions are highly, highly correlated. And this relationship is really quite prominent on, on medial lateral axis and not so strong on the anterior posterior axis, uh, wherein um, distant uh, subregions nonetheless still get uh, uh, similar dopaminergic recruitment. You know, we uh, leverage some clustering uh, methods to be able to identify what strata subregions receive hierarchically related dopaminergic input. We find that, uh, you know, across very a number of animals, I think uh, 14 uh, now to date, um, and many, many sessions at the highest crest uh, threshold, you always, always identify what we now know to be these more, more medial uh, territories of the striatum and or celestial striatal subregions. And if you progressively continue to increase your crestal threshold, you start to identify smaller and smaller striatal uh, uh, subregions uh, that are uh, quite effectively identified across multiple uh, days of, of clustering. This we thought was very interesting because it's reminiscent of what we know both in anatomy and functional studies in prior studies of, of the uh, different parts of the striatum that may be involved in, in uh, related uh, functional uh, specialization. This uh, centers around like organization pattern is also apparent at the micron scale. If you separate, if you look at here, uh, the uh, recruitment of different lattices of dopamine axons, they also tend to be organized in the centers around a pattern. And we thought uh, at least this at the micron scale, this is also a very interesting parallels with what has been reported across several labs of the activity of medium spiny neurons both in the D1 and D2 family that are also themselves uh, organized into these center surround correlation patterns, perhaps suggesting that there might be, you know, at multiple scales, um, um, 
these uh, anatomical clustering of functionally related um, uh, straddle subregions, um, not, not only at the small scale, but also on a medial lateral uh, axis also. So just to briefly summarize what these uh, findings uh, suggested to us that indeed uh, related and uh, nearby straddle subregions do indeed end up getting related or correlated to dopaminergic inputs. And so we next set out to assess whether these are indeed tailored to the computational or task specialty of local straddle subregions. And in the remaining portions of my talk, I'll take uh, a very a small straddle subregions as a case study to help answer this larger uh, hypothesis. So uh, in order to be able to do so, however, uh, we uh, reasoned that uh, indeed these flow-like propagation of wave-like uh, dynamics may end up producing temporal offsets in dopaminergic uh, activity arriving to different parts of the striatum. And that this may potentially regulate regional dopaminergic uh, dependent plasticity mechanisms. And so we next asked whether or not there are indeed uh, potentially uh, elementary trajectory uh, patterns uh, that may realize or vectorize an assortment of these lead lag relationships in dopamine, and whether or not these can indeed be uh, uh, important for modifying uh, spatial temporal or anatomical credit assignment or credit learning. So by using some convergent methods, we were able to identify a family of these uh, dopaminergic propagation patterns. I'll just uh, summarize uh, them here. Um, we found that there are these uh, laterally initiated medially propagating dopamine waves. We call these lateral medial waves. Uh, they produce an increase in dopamine first in the more lateral parts and then progressively delayed across uh, the striatum. And then there are these medially initiated laterally propagating waves. And they reverse the order of dopaminergic recruiter across uh, the striatum. And then finally, I've slowed down this final video quite a bit, but there are also these center initiated bilaterally propagating ones that really arrive across the different parts of the striatum almost in unison, uh, perhaps delivering some a form of a global or uniform pattern of recruitment. And because these elementary dopamine uh, trajectories are really enriched at reward outcome, we thought that uh, these motif waves may be a very interesting way of implementing or vectorizing a systematic dopaminergic uh, phase shift. For those of you who missed it, this is a reward response that I'll elaborate on in a couple of slides, uh, but you can see that there's a really uh, heterogeneous recruitment of dopaminergic axons across the striatum that are organized into these uh, very specific motif waves. Okay, here I'll, on this slide, I'll just tackle whether or not uh, there, uh, these uh, dopaminergic offsets that dopamine waves uh, produce are themselves indeed relevant for plasticity. And so, uh, this question was actually partially uh, answered in the brain slice uh, by the Katai group. Um, this is a study I summarized in my introduction also, uh, wherein what they did was they looked at uh, how uh, differentially delayed dop uh, dopaminergic optogenetic stimulations may end up affecting the amount of plasticity induced um, at the corticostriatal uh, synapse if dopaminergic was differentially delayed relative to this pre-postsynaptic recruitment. And what they found is really that if dopaminergic transients are really early relative to the glutamergic input together with current injection, that they don't, they're not really effective at all. And if they're very much delayed, they're also not effective, but there seems to be this, plus, this window by which dopaminergic input is very, very effective. Matter of fact, there's a kernel, it's not just a, a one uh, step function. This ends up being very, very interesting because this suggests that these differentially delayed dopaminergic inputs are indeed uh, important uh, for induction of plasticity within these circuits. And we next asked whether or not at the algorithmic or computational level, they can indeed participate in uh, differential reward learning. So many of you guys are familiar with how uh, reward prediction errors within a single reinforcement learning agent uh, propagates backwards from the initial uh, reward uh, back to uh, the initial CS tone. And this is also um, evolving together with value functions that are being learned about these intermediate states. But to understand the impact of dopamine uh, waves across a variety of these agents, we simulated how a bank of reinforcement learning agents that are themselves learning the same underlying CSUS association, but we empirically changed the delay of this uh, reward that's aliving at different um, agents. 
to assess the extent to which um, these uh, delayed uh, reward signals may end up affecting uh, the relative amounts of learning uh, CS uh, US associations. And this uh, uh, video just very briefly answers that question is as, as you go through uh, the different uh, amounts of trials, this is the propagation of uh, back propagation of these reward prediction errors. What you find is that these uh, agents have received no delays back propagate their reward prediction errors much faster than these agents that received really delayed uh, reward prediction errors. This is a capture at the very end of trial. You can see these uh, no delay uh, agents that are in blue here back propagate their prediction errors and they fully learn this value trajectory. And you can see that uh, these ones that received a long delay do not really have an opportunity to back propagate uh, their prediction errors. Again, these simulations suggesting to us that these uh, wave like delays can indeed drive a spatially asymmetric uh, reward uh, learning. So we next ask whether or not this is true in the brain. Um, I'll also just uh, take a pause uh, to see if there are any questions uh, from the crowd. I think Pete McGill has a question. Uh, please go ahead. Hi, Arif. Thanks. Um, I don't know if you're going to delve into this later, but in terms of the mechanisms that may underlie these waves you see in striatum, would you expect to see a midbrain correlate or a midbrain origin of these waves? Or, or is this really speaking to that dissociation between the forebrain and midbrain that you and colleagues have demonstrated in other parts of the circuit, the ventral, but not the dorsal, right? Um, so where does the midbrain fit into this? <laughs> yes, this is, uh, thanks for raising. This is a very big question. Uh, um, right now, the best I can say is I don't know and perhaps punt a little bit more discussion towards the end of the talk, but I'll just uh, maybe briefly say this, that um, we think there are a variety of candidate mechanisms that may independently or jointly work together to produce these waves at different epochs of, of behavioral performance. And um, it's entirely likely that uh, what I'm uh, saying here will uh, make sense once I show you the remaining portions of the talk. So maybe that's the very first question I'll tackle uh, once I finish. Okay. So um, there's a couple questions in the chat. Um, so first, just uh, asking if you could define what spatially asymmetric reward learning means. Yeah, what I mean by spatially asymmetric is really trying to capture, um, uh, the, by asymmetry, I really mean a gradient, right? It's, it's, um, it's just me trying to articulate that these agents are able to learn differently than these agents, uh, just based on uh, this delay that I have just manually uh, induced into uh, the circuitry. Hope that's helpful. And then the other question is, um, I'm curious to know um, how this is related to the notion of distributional RL um, by Uchida, Bavatnik, and others. Yeah, so this is, uh, uh, in, and, and I hope uh, this answer uh, will make more sense as I go on in the study. It's a related concept, although uh, it's different at multiple levels, both at the implementational level, but also how the distribution, the head quote heterogeneity itself is, uh, is originating in the system. I think um, the distributional literature is still trying to work out exactly how the different um, inflection points of the, the pessimism or optimism that uh, was uh, suggested in, in, in the dopamine spiking effectively comes from, potentially it's coming from uh, uh, different parts of the dopaminergic, uh, excuse, excuse me, straddle systems that are coming in that may have different um, kind of horizons of, of reward expectation or perhaps different discount rates and, and others. Um, whereas we think these dopaminergic weights is related to the question that Pete had. We think that these, uh, the heterogeneity uh, in these dopaminergic waves are really being produced uh, through potentially local mechanisms. Um, um, and and maybe I'll I'll just I'll just also punt on this towards the end because it builds on what I'm about to say in the next remaining portions of the talk. 
sorry, I'm just punting too much. Um, any more questions? Okay, so uh, again, so we're going to test this really much broader hypothesis that dopamine is indeed tailored to the functional specialty of local subregions by taking a case study of this dorsal medial uh, striatum's uh, specialty in uh, action outcome or agency learning. And so we're going to ask whether or not dopamine waves can indeed influence instrumental learning and affect uh, behaviors. And as an animals pursue these distant uh, goals and, and get rewards, we know from uh, uh, previous literature that these more medial parts of the dorsal stratum, dorsal medial stratum, is really enriched with neural representations for whether or not actions are responsible for attaining uh, rewards, effectively performing continuous inference over uh, whether or not there's evidence for agency, and then voting for candidate um, uh, policies or action plans of how to perform within this environment. Um, I'll just emphasize that, you know, if you inactivate or you block dopaminergic transmission within uh, these medial subregions, um, you know, work from several decades and labs have demonstrated that there's a focal deficiency you induce in these animals in terms of um, agency, where animals uh, really uh, have a lack of learning whether or not rewards are, are themselves are under instrumental control or not. And so this is, uh, we designed a couple of uh, very uh, simple tasks, uh, uh, mouse friendly tasks to, in order to be able to probe uh, this question as to whether or not dopamine within the dorsal medial striatum um, is really relaying signals related to the local functional specialty, which is computing uh, inference over agency. So in this task, we have animals head restrained and they get audio visual feedback that mimics this uh, corridor that they're under, the, they're in. And we have these two versions of this task, an instrumental version, wherein them walking on this wheel displaces them through the environment, and another one where um, walking, uh, getting closer to this back wall wherein reward gets delivered is really not related to their locomotion, but rather just mere passage of time um, uh, gets them reward. And here we have, you know, task designs where in, you know, in any given trial, uh, there's a uniform distribution of a month of, a month of distance to go or amount of time to wait uh, so that uh, the animal really has to rely on online sensory evidence as much as possible in order both to infer agency within uh, these tasks or get evidence that their actions actually do not control uh, reward pursuit. This is a video of what it looks like in these animals. You see this uh, mouse walking gets propelled through this corridor and once it gets uh, to the very end, it gets a little bit of sucrose and it Consumes it. Uh, whereas uh, this is another version where you get this continuous uh, propagation uh, through this corridor. We've also done uh, this uh, task variant where it's these animals get a, a yoked version of the displacement through this world that other animals experience. And for a sake of time and clarity, I won't be talking about those sessions today. Okay, so the basic hypothesis here is that indeed, if the dorsal medial striatum is um, computing, um, um, evidence for agency are my actions responsible for attaining rewards. Uh, the hypothesis is, is that these uh, dopaminergic signals in the DMS, if tailored to local subregions, would be sensitive to ev dynamic evidence for agency across the two tasks. And then they would be able to provide, um, uh, uh, they would be able to kind of drive plasticity within the system uh, so that it would help guide animals uh, to learn um, whether or not um, um, their actions uh, control the environment and therefore regulate future behaviors. Okay, so the prediction is if the animal is in an instrumental task and its actions control the world, what you want to do is provide, you know, large reinforcement signals to the dorsal medial style subregion so the animal is more likely to run more in future trials. And then the opposite is true if the animal is not in control of the world, the DMS continues to make predictions about I'm in control, I'm in control, and so forth. You want to decrease the amount of reinforcement you provide um, to the more medial subregions and provide uh, less running. I'll also just uh, squeeze in uh, a point that I will perhaps elaborate on later on. It's not just um, these reinforcement signals you need to provide, but you also need to um, deliver a signal online during the voting process itself to these dorsal medial style subregions that hey, your predictions are wrong, your predictions are wrong, and so forth, continuously online. Um, and then at the end of a trial, uh, provide a reinforcement signal that 
says, oh, you're credited with a negative uh, or, or not as good as uh, a reward because your predictions were wrong. And I'll elaborate on this in just a moment. Okay, these are the first pass results. Uh, so we find that at reward outcome, if the animal is within an instrumental task, right, when the animals complete this, what we find are these medially initiated, laterally propagating dopamine waves that themselves produce a super fast increase in dopamine at the dorsomedial stratum, but those that are progressively delayed arriving to these more lateral subregions. And this is what I've summarized here. This is a latency of people. By contrast, if the animal just completed, I'm sorry, this is just to show that, you know, this is true in the instrumental task on a trial by trial basis, there are these uh, wave directions that are um, uh, these uh, laterally directed waves that produce this sequence. By contrast, if the animal is in the Pavlovian task, what you actually get are these waves that are initiated in the more lateral subregions and propagate out to those uh, more uh, medial parts. And there you reverse the order of uh, dopamine arriving in the DMS in particular, uh, being uh, significantly delayed relative to these other parts. And again, here, these are wave directions uh, continuously. So what these results uh, suggest that when the animal is an instrumental task, you get a faster increase in dopamine uh, right at reward. And that during a Pavlovian condition, you get a, 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 a decreased latency to peak within uh, the dorsomedial style subregions. And so uh, this suggested to us that indeed dopamine waves are, are tailoring regional dopamine uh, within the dorsal stratum. And, and the idea here is that we're connecting to that uh, 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 kernel of plasticity that, that, that I mentioned, I should have put it up here, um, that these differential delays in dopamine arriving uh, with different latencies at the dorsal medial stratum are perhaps indeed inducing um, uh, different amounts of plasticity within these dorsal medial stratum region. So we next ask whether these opponent wave uh, trajectories are indeed important for credit learning or, or whether or not uh, behavioral credit learning, whether or not it affects future animal behaviors. So to do this, we designed a within session uh, uh, block reversal where animals uh, unbeknownst to them are, uh, are uh, transitioned between these instrumental and Pavlovian conditions uh, uh, that last 20 to 30 hours. Behaviorally, these animals uh, uh, show me that they're indeed uh, continuously making inferences about uh, how much they control a reward because they change their velocities dynamically when animals uh, transition, for example, from an instrumental block where they're running quite fast uh, through these corridor and they enter a Pavlovian condition, they progressively decrease the amount that they run within these blocks. And the converse is true when they enter an instrumental uh, session. And so what we find indeed are opponent uh, dopamine wave directions, uh, much uh, like I've uh, just recently showed you, um, and I hope you can appreciate this uh, at a block reversal. Within Pavlovian conditions, you get these waves that are immediately directed. And then actually, right when you have a, a, a block transition, you have these continued uh, immediately directed waves that then immediately reverse and then uh, start going towards uh, these lateral directions. And here's one way to quantify this. You get these dynamic wave reversals uh, that are also um, mirroring the changes in the locomotion or velocity of these animals. And so we next ask whether or not these wave, uh, dynamic wave directions uh, in previous trials are capable of predicting how much animals run in future trials. And so we separated the velocity, how much animals run, based on the wave experience on previous trials. And indeed, we find that uh, uh, waves uh, that are laterally directed that produce rapid increase in the more medial parts of the stratum are those associated with um, speeded uh, velocity. Uh, and the converse is true for those uh, waves that are in opponent in direction. This is the relationship. And this is another way to demonstrate uh, <clears throat> the same result, which is a, a regression analysis uh, demonstrating that it's not just uh, wave direction in the very last trial that strongly predicts how much animals run in future trial, but their uh, uh, wave direction from the last trial, uh, smaller in magnitude and, and, and also uh, uh, that comes uh, to zero, uh, that helps explain uh, these uh, future uh, velocities. What's also very interesting is that, you know, I also record simultaneously with uh, uh, a TD tomato channel that is meant to be used as control. And we see that uh, patterns of uh, 
changes in the TD tomato channel are not helping to explain these regression patterns of, of uh, data. And so we use uh, these results uh, to uh, conclude that indeed these opponent wave directions uh, may be uh, uh, used for behavioral flexibility in these animals. Okay, I'll just uh, provide a brief uh, summary as I'm uh, coming to a close in, in this talk, maybe five more slides or so. Um, so taken together, our results are suggesting indeed that when animals are in the instrumental task, perhaps these opponent dopamine waves are providing an, a, a, a large increase in the amount of reinforcement being delivered to the dorsal medial style subregion uh, just based on the temporal lags. And that waves are indeed uh, waves at reward outcome are indeed sensitive to changing reward contingencies. That, they, that is the reverse directions, perhaps to dynamically deliver reward to and away uh, for uh, uh, from the dorsal medial stratum uh, dynamically. And that they uh, these waves end up preceding and predicting the animal's future behavioral adaptations for reward pursuit. And so uh, together, uh, this is uh, now suggesting to us that dopaminergic reward uh, credit or RPEs at reward outcome are indeed tailored to the, this specific dorsal medial striatum's role in agency learning uh, when waves are used to vectorize the relative timing of this uh, arrival of this uh, uh, reward uh, credit signal. And perhaps this is a mechanism by which um, dopamine is tailored uh, to the computational uh, demand of this underlying region. And I'll take uh, <clears throat> just a couple of uh, minutes to uh, describe how we were able to formalize um, um, how uh, these uh, wave-like uh, dopaminergic uh, patterns um, in hierarchical uh, dopaminergic circuits may end up uh, 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 being used or, or to help the system or the animal infer agency. And this is uh, also a really important link to performance and learning, uh, which I'll elaborate more on, much like I did in the, in the beginning portions of my talk. <clears throat> the basic idea here uh, is that we uh, constructed or built on a model that Michael Frank had worked on for about a decade or so, which is effectively a hierarchical mixture of expert model uh, for uh, decision making both choice and learning um, and uh, at the highest level you have an agent uh, uh, which is trying to decide whether or not to run or not um, in order to pursue rewards <clears throat> and this uh, agent has um, is composed of a couple of agents uh, experts i should say uh, that themselves accumulate evidence for control uh, in this uh, DMS-like distant expert, or another expert that itself accumulates evidence for how much elapsed time predicts um, is associated with reward delivery. And so uh, one uh, prediction, for example, is this DMS-like uh, 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 agent um, will accumulate within a single trial, will accumulate evidence as to how accurate its predictions are as the agent gets more and more of the sensory information about whether or not the animal is in control of uh, rewards or not. Whereas if uh, the model is in a Pavlovian task, uh, the amount of evidence or responsibility signal that this expert receives are progressively ramping uh, down and down as it's proving to be uh, more and more inaccurate. Each of these sub-experts uh, contain subordinate uh, sub-experts that themselves specialize in very specific contingencies that the agent or animal is exposed to, both under the distance condition and also under the time condition. And so each of these sub-experts will uh, also get an opportunity to test their predictions and receive local responsibility signals that are proportional to how accurate the predictions of each subregion's uh, contingencies are. And so here, for example, when an animal is completing a long uh, trial, the, the agent that predicts that, you know, a, a tone changes or the visual display changes every eight centimeter continuously occurs uh, more uh, responsibility or evidence, uh, whereas these other sub-experts are uh, hearing a less uh, uh, responsibility signals. Finally, at the lowest level, as the agent um, experiences each tone deflection or each change in sensory uh, um, in the sensory world um, that are themselves modeled as state transitions 
uh, in, in temptation, each sub-expert will experience a, re a sensory uh, a state transition prediction error at state transitions that are proportional to how accurate they are. So the most ex uh, the most uh, accurate sub-expert actually does not receive any of these state transition prediction errors, whereas the most inaccurate ones will uh, receive a bunch of these uh, prediction errors. And so uh, we made a series of predictions about how such hierarchical uh, structure um, uh, could be implemented in, in, the, in the dorsal striatum and how dopaminergic signals uh, may be uh, 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 systematically related to some of these predictions that we generated, which uh, we patch out in the paper and I uh, recommend you guys go see it, but I'll just, for the sake of time, I'll focus on this highest level, level one um, specialty. So the prediction here is really that this dorsomedial striatum uh, sub-like uh, expert, the distance expert, will receive during reward performance, the, during this performance epoch, will receive uh, responsibility signals, uh, will accumulate evidence in different directions across the two tasks. And this is indeed what we find, is that if we look at uh, the dopamine uh, levels, selectively in the dorsomedial striatum, in the instrumental task, we get this build up of dopamine as animals complete more and more of uh, these uh, single trials. And the converse is true here in the Pavlovian condition. And you can start to see this in uh, the reversal, block reversal version, you see this ramp up in dopamine that is followed by ramp down, ramp up, ramp down. This is kind of a three-dimensional view that is only largely the dorsomedial striatum that is experiencing the dorsomedial ramp down in the Pavlovian condition and a ramp up during the instrumental condition. And uh, across these blocks, you also get this uh, dynamic change in the uh, uh, ramp up profile uh, across the dorsomedial striatum. And we think that these dynamics at the, during the anticipatory epochs are actually very critical for how waves are expressed at reward outcome, because these uh, changes in the ramp profile across the stratum um, are, are linked very directly. So if you look at what's happening under the Pavlovian condition, you can see the dorsomedial stratum so regions are progressively getting a ramp down in dopamine, and then you get a dopamine wave that's initiating, initiating mostly in the more lateral parts and going uh, towards the more medial parts. By contrast, under the instrumental condition, these dorsal medial style subregions, as their predictions are proving to be more and more correct, are receiving a ramp up of dopamine that then produces an initial increase in the more medial parts itself and then propagates out laterally. And so one consequence of uh, these findings is that it's really suggesting to us that during the anticipatory epoch, dopamine, largely through the excitability effects, is really providing evidence for how accurate the predictions of these underlying subregions are. And so it's providing a spatiotemporal um, kind of responsibility or eligibility signal, eligibility for how much credit it should receive because what's happening at reward outcome is you get waves that are directed in one direction or the other uh, that uh, um, deliver, uh, where uh, uh, reward response delays are really in proportion to the accuracy of, of the prediction of the underlying subregion itself. I hope that made sense and I'm happy to elaborate more on this. And so by providing evidence for this hierarchical uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning model, we're really able uh, to suggest uh, this vectorization or, or um, heterogeneous functions of dopamine, not only at reward outcome for learning about agency, but also during the performance epoch to wherein a dopamine is start to uh, signal this responsibility or accuracy signal to different uh, reinforcement learning agents. And so instead of the scalar broadcast dopaminergic signal that we think of, especially based on recordings within the midbrain, uh, this uh, formalization really provides us uh, with a framework by which we can um, uh, suggest how dopamine at the local subregions, at the delivery site, which I call the business end, is really providing a spatiotemporal vectorization of these dopaminergic signals. Here, I'll just conclude by saying, you know, these early studies that I suggested, you know, uh, really helped us uh, realize the, how intertwined the fundamental dual roles of dopamine are for regulating both ongoing and also future behaviors. 
And that I also suggested that this global broadcast view of dopamine really does not account for these heterogeneous functions across different parts of the striatum. And that we suggested this revised view that dopamine may be tailored to the underlying striatal subregions specialized uh, to the underlying uh, computational requirements. I demonstrated this empirical finding that dopamine waves end up coordinating dopamine signals in different parts of the striatum when um, it correlates dopamine uh, input related to related striatal subregions, functionally and also nearby striatal subregions. And that rewards tend to synchronize dopamine axons into these uh, opponent uh, dopamine waves that we think end up vectorizing the relative timing of this really important plasticity modulator. And by uh, using the dorsal striatum's role in agency learning uh, as a case study, uh, we were suggesting that indeed uh, waves end up implementing a spatiotemporal or structural credit assignment at reward outcome, uh, whereas uh, during uh, reward pursuit itself, into the performance epoch, dopamine is really relaying how valuable the computations of any given style subregions predictions are in any given task or reward pursuit. And so this is the link to the ventral striatum dopamine ramps that I demonstrated. If you're performing an inherently motivational task wherein uh, computations related to how worthwhile your effort is, then you get dopamine ramps in that part of the striatum um, that is going to be related to how accurate those predictions are um, in the pursuit of reward. Okay, with that, I'll conclude. Uh, I, I, I did this work in collaboration between Chris Moore and Michael Frank's labs. I, I'm really thankful to the members who provided a lot of uh, feedback and, and, and evidence, uh, excuse me, feedback and guidance, um, and also those who directly, undergraduates who directly helped uh, with this project. Um, I got my funding uh, from Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and also my mentor were, uh, mentors were funded from the NIMH and, and National Science Foundation. Thank you guys very much. Thanks so much, Arif. That was a really great talk. Um, we can move on. Uh, we've got some time for questions. So I've got uh, one hand up already, uh, Flavi. Oh, maybe not. Okay. Um, well, before. I can... I was going to say, go I can go back question. to the question. Sorry, I think I'm speaking at the same time as you. Maybe there's a delay. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, you uh, you can go back to the questions from before. Yes, uh, what I was going to go to was actually uh, go back to you know Pete's question, which is really about mechanism, right? We ended up building the story upward and trying to assess how you know, these waves may be involved in behavior and what their computational role may be. But there's also really important questions at the uh, uh, mechanistic level. And so one idea is really that, you know, if you have some sequential activation at the, tar at the target subregion, perhaps there is sequential spiking within the midbrain that is, you know, combined with top topography of projection pattern uh, that ends up predicting these sequence of, of projection. I think this is what uh, Pete perhaps was hinting. And this, you know, keeps intact, you know, the excitation release coupling framework that we have in neuroscience that is, that is uh, so important. So, so the basic idea is, you know, uh, you have the system getting recruited this way. Uh, another one is, you know, you, you know, there's uh, several uh, people even within your local community, including Steph Craig, that is starting to demonstrate that there's quite a bit of local regulation of, of dopamine uh, at the targets of regions independent from spiking itself. So, you know, while there is some evidence for cholinergic modulation, there's also evolving evidence at the level of uh, GABAergic shunt currents uh, that may be arriving from either local or, or maybe not so local GABAergic inputs onto the dopamine axon that may affect propagation of, of um, uh, spikes within uh, the branches. And so uh, one really interesting aspect is that, you know, um, uh, Josh Goldberg uh, has uh, done these initial recordings where they're showing that they're like uh, potentially wave like uh, propagation patterns uh, in the neural pill of the cholinergic interneurons. So it'd be really interesting to know whether or not they are related to the activation patterns of dopamine uh, axons within the striatum as a, as, a, as a precursor to assess whether or not uh, cholinergic interactions may end up affecting this propagation patterns. Where I would personally put my money though, is that 
oops, this is just to say that, you know, there's ways of uh, testing this. Where I would personally put my money though, is that both of these uh, events uh, mechanisms are indeed happening at the same time and they're just interacting at different uh, moments uh, in, in task performance. And so, you know, you have this top down mechanism that is indeed producing these uh, co cholinergic uh, 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 influence dopaminergic uh, release largely during the performance epoch whereas the midbrain is still encoding reward prediction errors is largely recruited at surprising state transitions or at the very end of the task when reward arrives and perhaps you end up with this sequential recruitment of dopamine waves across the striatum because we call this the trampoline effect, that this top-down mechanism is setting up some excitability gradient of dopaminergic axons across the striatum. By the way, it's performing its own computation, which I'll say on in just a, more on in just a moment. But when the midbrain gets recruited, the directionality of the dopaminergic waves in the axon completely depends on when the midbrain spike or burst occurs relative to this gradient that's dynamically being set by cholinergic regulation. This is what we call the trampoline effect. And so this is how um, we think that this top-down input, the cholinergic input is really uh, performing uh, computations about how the local predictions of ensembles of medium spiny uh, neurons is really congruent with the sensory evidence that's coming in from the external environment. And so you get a local calculation of how accurate the predictions or the action policies of these ensembles of striatal subregions are. And that's you know, being facilitated through local interactions and perhaps cholinergic or other cortical inputs. And you get uh, ramps of dopamine in three dimension being expressed in three dimension that is quite dynamic, that is uh, providing evidence for uh, at the circuit level uh, how accurate the local subregion is. And then dopaminergic input uh, from the midbrain at reward will effectively wash over based on the gradient that's been produced. And so therefore, that's why we interpret these gradients as a form of an eligibility signal, uh, wherein areas that have already been very, very accurate are getting ramps up in dopamine that is causing them to have uh, their action policies gated through because they're so accurate and their D1 pathways are being potentiated by dopaminergic plasticity mechanisms. And so if they're getting through, they're in control of uh, the behavioral outputs of the animal. And therefore, when midbrain dopamine cells burst, these are the subregions that get the very first dopaminergic increases. So they have the strongest uh, plasticity uh, given their uh, cortical inputs that they're getting. I hope that answer is sufficiently clear and I'm really happy to talk more about this. That was a really helpful explanation, I think. Um, we've got another hand up. It's Pete. Sorry, I'm hogging again. That was really nice. I think, I think the, I think the and is much more convincing than the or. Um, but the question arises how, how one might engage an effector. So you have the waves, but waves in striatum don't influence behavior, right? Something's got to leave striatum. So that's got to be an SPN activity. And so have you had a chance to either think about or, or demonstrate whether there is a wave-like correlate in the activity of spiny projection neurons that might, might, might be another reflection of, for example, changes in synaptic weights or how these patterns are actually influencing behavior? Yeah, this is another really uh, uh, good uh, question, Pete. And these are definitely the kind of next set of uh, questions that are um, on the table for my lab to explore, both in relation to kind of dynamics at the cholinergic cells, uh, but also, you know, at the effectors, the postsynaptic cells themselves. I, I will just say a couple of things. One is, it's not it may not necessarily be the case that you get. Um, very large territories or ensembles of the dopa the medium spiny cells that are themselves also perhaps engaged in these wave-like patterns. Per but perhaps maybe you'll have um, a select few of spiny cells that may care computationally about another axis um, 
not necessarily the rote gating of very specific uh, motor or, or, or cognitive uh, commands themselves. So it's entirely likely that um, dopamine may be, you know, affecting its influence through, uh, through a subset of medium spinal cells and, and not others. I'm, I'm trying to say something subtle here, but it just requires that I elaborate a little bit more. Um, so, so the basic idea is, um, I didn't say very much about this, but um, at this lowest level uh, of the model, each of the sub-experts that we think of as ensembles of different cells, uh, medium, medium spiny cells, are uh, receiving you know, transient reward prediction error signals if their predictions are actually not accurate. And so, but the way these uh, dopaminergic reward prediction errors are computed requires something that's super counterintuitive because it's actually a subregion that is not receiving these prediction errors ends up accumulating more and more evidence. So this is kind of a, a counterintuitive relationship between dopaminergic spikes during performance and ramps up uh, uh, that scales with how accurate sub those subregions are. And that link I think of as actually a special class of medium spiny cells, perhaps, you know, uh, the, the, the difference between patches and matrices that, that really fundamentally care about a different computation uh, that's passing through the striatum that may relate directly with these dopamine waves. But I'm, I'm sure we'll talk more about this later. Very cool. Um, I think it looks like we're running short on time. Um, Mark's going to hold his question for the meeting just after. Um, are there any other questions that anyone has to ask Arif before we close? I don't see any. So if not, um, thank you so much, Arif, for a wonderful talk. Um, and we'll make this available on YouTube um, soon so that anybody who missed it in anyone's groups will be able to have access to it. Um, thanks so much again, Arif, for a wonderful talk. and. Hopefully we'll get to have you uh, in person at some point in the future. Yes, for sure. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I look forward to more meetings. Cheers. Thanks. Um, see you in on the other Zoom meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye. Right. Bye. Thanks, everybody.